Good morning. Good afternoon. Wherever you are, you know, it's um, probably not people people from um, from the east of the Middle East, uh, meaning Asia and others, are not on the call because this is not a convenient time. Um, and we have Daniel Sego, who has presented on tokenization in uh, Blockchain NYC before. And he's also uh, an expert in, you know, he's a blockchain architect, so he'll be able to tell us a little more about what's going on in cross-border payments and CBDCs which is a topic we chose for today. Two, two announcements. One is uh, we are under the Hyperledger Foundation, so we have to follow the antitrust policies of Hyperledger, which is also applicable wherever you join from. Uh, different places have different uh, laws or rules regarding antitrust. You just have to follow your jurisdiction's antitrust. The second is about respect. And uh, you are, of course, allowed to be, um, to disagree with people, but you have to do it without being disagreeable, which means you have to respect each other uh, that is the other condition, the administrative uh, guidelines from Hyperledger. So without wait, wasting too much more time, let's hear uh, Daniel uh, on this topic. And I will just disappear into the background. The meeting is being recorded. Daniel, please go ahead and hopefully you can present. I think you should be able to, but if you're not, just let me know. So thanks a lot. Uh, let me just give a, sh give a shot and try to share my screen. Uh, hopefully you see, see my screen. Uh, and I will just stop the video uh, because my bandwidth is sometimes a little bit limited, uh, but theoretically you should see my screen. So yeah. uh, welcome everybody and and thank thank you very much, uh, Vipin, for this uh, for this great in introduction. Uh, what I'm gonna talk today about is like using just a blockchain. Just a second. Uh, sorry, um, can you go into presentation mode? We can see your uh, screen, but if you go into presentation mode. Yeah, I, I would rather not do it because then I, I can't switch. So I, I just prepared a couple of like uh, pages. And if oh, I beautiful, just- Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, it's just, usually it's just big enough. It's just, you know, I, I can make it a little bit like smaller. It's just, if I go to presentation mode, then, um, you know, sometimes my screen sucks a little bit and I just can't switch uh, between presentation and, and prepared slides. So it's like like this one, for instance. No problem. Just go ahead, please. Okay. Thanks a lot. But, but I hope it's it's big enough. Uh, so it's it's just visible, uh, basically. So uh, then then welcome everybody. Uh, uh, basically, uh, what I'm gonna have today is is a presentation on blockchain and and cross border payments, uh, which is a pretty interesting topic. Uh, I would say, uh, and then perhaps just like two sentences from from my side. I'm a I'm a software architect uh, dealing with with many different projects, mostly mostly blockchain projects. I got like two directions. Uh, one is one is of course I'm I'm pretty strongly involved in in the Hyperledger community. Um, so I mean most competence I have with Hyperledger Fabric, uh, but I usually make presentations on on different interesting topics. Uh, for instance. And then, and then occasionally I do like uh, public blockchain projects as well. That means uh, sometimes solidity or solidity based uh, systems and, and and developments as well. So the presentation for today is 
is blockchain for cross-border payments. And I just prepared a couple of slides. So I have like like a couple of slides at the beginning on, on cross-border payments. What are the issues of cross-border payments? Uh, how cross-border payment can be regarded as, as kind of an interoperability problem uh, with like many stages or many payment models. I got one one slide on on a very simple example on, on correspondent banking uh, via cross border uh, I mean cross border payment via correspondent banking, and then I will have just the the classical uh, roadmap on CD, CBDC uh, projects throughout the world, and I just pick like three uh, exciting projects. Uh, these are not necessarily the the newest projects, but they have like strong involvement in 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 hyperledger. I mean in the hyperledger stack. It's like Enbridge, Project Neighbor, Icebreaker. And at the end, I have just like, um, yeah, like a small, I would say comparison, uh, how like wholesale cross-border CBDC projects can help with, with cross-border payments and then some conclusions and, and further challenges. Uh, so this is this is like the agenda uh, for my for my presentation. Um, we, we can have like a questions, answers and discussions at the end, I would say, uh, I mean, if, if if you have like you know small questions or perhaps if, if my if my network is not stable enough uh then then you can interrupt me and and then then just go ahead but for longer discussions Q&A, i thought uh we're gonna have time at the end so that's the plan for today and that's the idea for today so let me just jump into the details uh and then start with cross-border payments um, so typical cross-border payment use cases like like in e-commerce, in remittance, uh, it's just uh, practically uh, just transferring money abroad. Uh, in international trade, of course, um, in travel, especially, uh, it's again a business use case is like business payouts. It's like trading platforms, and the more enterprise use cases like like having cross-border payments in, in corporate treasury flows. Uh, I have just one slide on the right. Uh, that's practically the, the sheer amount of, uh, of cross-border payments uh, split by use cases uh, from 2018 through 2022. And it can be seen that, that it, is, it is being increased. It's being uh, heavily increased, I would say. Uh, what's perhaps more important is the is the percentage of of different use cases uh, of this um, of this increase. So we can see like uh, C to C uh, customer to customer use cases. That's like I don't know probably at travel uh, we can see something something similar. That's that's practically a small and constant segment at the top. Uh, we can see uh, see customer to business use cases. That's again, that's probably, I don't know, travel for instance, uh, or perhaps reminiscence is, is C to C or C to B use case. But it's again, it is slightly increasing uh, on the top, but it's not very, but not very much uh, increasing. Uh, we can see like business to customer use cases. That's again, that's pretty constant at the top. And what's increasing very heavily, that's like business to business relationship and business to business use cases. I would say like international trade, uh, corporate treasury flows um, and stuff like that are related to, to this category. So it's, I would say that's for sure an increasingly important topic. Uh, unfortunately, cross-border payment is not very efficient or regard, usually regarded to be not very efficient. Um, it's even the G20 uh, has a roadmap uh, for, for enchanting uh, cross-border payments. Uh, there's like a year, uh, there's like a report for that practically every year. Uh, so the problem is with cross-border payment that it has like many inefficiencies. Uh, for the first round, uh, it's, it's expensive. Um, so it has transaction costs and exchange rates, uh, which are sometimes yeah pretty ridiculous, uh, I would say. Um, so like there's estimated that, for instance, in terms of transaction costs, transaction costs uh, of an 
of a cross-border payment use case on average is, is kind of 6.3%. Uh, uh, but it can be sometimes between between 5 to almost 12%. So it can, it can be pretty expensive in, in some use cases. Uh, then one problem is that, I mean, the actors uh, that play a role in this, uh, in this use case Operating in a in a limited operating hours, it's it's usually like eight hours, not seven twenty four, so it it results in a low speed, uh, practically. So like a settlement or a clearing or settlement, uh, behind the scenes might take like like five days. So even if like you know a credit card payment um seems to be happening um just right away, uh, but the but the clearing and settlement behind might take days, or in some some you know very bad situations, it might take like weeks even. So that's certainly one of the uh, source of or one of the inefficiencies and one of the <coughs> sorry source of inefficiency is the is the limited operating hours of the of the actors or of the of the nodes maintaining the system. Uh, one of the problem is the limited transparency. Uh, basically, it's not very much visible uh, what's happening with uh, with a cross border transfer, especially if it had if if it if it has like uh, many actors uh, execute, executing this transfer. Then there might be some compliance and legal issues like tax issues, and then there can be many problems with with limited interoperability. Uh, so there's just just one idea to consider cross border payment as an interoperability problem, uh, which has like infrastructure challenges, uh, which can have multiply different intermediaries, uh, different operational complexity. Again, perhaps uh, different limited operating hours of the individual nodes uh, can be regarded as as an interoperability challenge as well. So in some sense, problems of cross-border payments can be regarded as, as interoperability uh, uh, challenges. And there's actually a BIS report on that, uh, which tries to analyze somehow uh, problems and, and challenges of cross-border payment as interoperability challenges. Uh, they use like uh, two different uh, dimensions, I would say. Uh, one dimension is, is this one. So if we speak of like interoperability, what we mean here is like like uh, like the possibility of cooperations of of different uh, payment systems uh, probably, and then if we speak of like interop, in this sense, it might not be just one statical thing, but we might as we might as well have some different dimensions. So, for instance, or as an example, uh, we can speak of like technical interoperability. These are like technical infrastructure challenges. Or the similarities or or differences of of different technical infrastructures, uh, as an example, message formats and so on and so forth. We can speak of semantic interoperability. Uh, that's like the same interpretation of data. So I mean, usually we think of that way that there should be some kind of a technical interoperability, and if we have that, then then it's a questionable if we have semantic, or if we do not have semantic. And on the top, if we have both technical and semantic interoperability, then 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 we might as well have or might as well not have business interoperability on top, which are the practically same rights, obligations, doing business, uh, legal compliance, and and stuff like that. Uh, so just giving one simple example, if we if we just consider this this meeting here. Uh, then we can speak of like three different interoperability. Uh, one is like a technical one, which is which is practically the uh, this conference, which is which is going on a on a voice over IP protocol. That's kind that's kind of a technical interop part, I would say. And then we can speak of like semantic interoperability in this meeting, which is which might be like the language. Um, having like English as a general language, and we might as well speak of like some business interoperability as well. It's like you know having Q and at the end, or just uh, from my side perhaps reading the chat just occasionally, uh, and so on and so forth. So one way of thinking problems in cross-border payments is like thinking of interoper interoperability 
of course, if we have many systems that are not imper- uh, not compatible with each other, uh, not from a technical, semantical, or business perspective, then of course the whole system uh, will be inefficient. It will be expensive. It w- it will be slow and and not the best. Uh, if we speak of like cross border payment, one of the classical model is like correspondent banking. <clears throat> And then practically means like uh, on a very high level, this is just one slide, a very high level slide, just to demonstrate um, actually the interoperability problems um, in cross-border payment. So if you speak of like correspondent banking, you mean like like accounts or services on behalf of settlements, sometimes uh, treasury services operations, foreign exchanges, uh, Nostrovo through accounts. One example is like the Euro dollar. I mean, if we, if we mean of like the cross-border payment side. So just giving one example, uh, which is here, let me just imagine that we are Starbucks and then we just want to transfer money from, from New York to, actually it's Deutsche Bank London. Uh, so we might just think of like London, but if it's Deutsche Bank, we might think of like Frankfurt as well. So let me just think of, we are Starbucks and we just want to transfer like $10 or $10 million uh, from our uh, New York account to our London or Deutsche Bank account. So for the first round, it's it's pretty simple. It's, it's just the very simple model, uh, what we got here. It looks that way, it should be like minus 10, uh, from our uh, New York GP Morgan account, and it should be like uh, plus 10 on our Deutsche Bank account uh, as an asset. And basically on the liability slide, uh, we can have like, like that. It's it's going to be like minus 10 from GP Morgan New York from the Star- uh, Starbucks accounts. And it's going to be just uh, just plus 10 on the liability side from, from Deutsche Bank London. But the problem is that, uh, let me just imagine in this very simple situation, uh, that we have the account at JP Morgan and on the London side, we have we have like account at the Deutsche Bank. Uh, but then let me just imagine uh, the JP Morgan and Deutsche Bank uh, doesn't really have any connections. I'm not quite sure it, uh, if it's true, but uh, let me just imagine for this, for this example. So let me just imagine that uh, basically we, get, we got City, City New York and City New York and Deutsche Bank uh, has some connections. So practically Deutsche Bank London has like an account at City New York, basically. So what we need to do for this cross-border transfer, we just we just need to have City on the roadmap uh, somehow. And what we need to do, that's, that's like two things. Um, so first, JP Morgan New York should transfer some to see that's practically this minus 10 reserves from assets from GP Morgan side and this plus 10 reserves uh, on the city side, which is practically manifested on the account of Deutsche Bank London on the city New York uh, side, practically on the city New York account. And then it's going to be like, again, as we have this one, it's going to be, as I mean, this liability is the account of the Deutsche Bank at city New York we're going to have like this plus 10 on the city New York. I mean, in the Deutsche Bank as an asset, which is the account on the city New York side. And this going to be actually the plus 10 Starbucks account uh, amount. So uh, this was a very simple example, of course. Uh, perhaps it's it's just oversimplified. But it clearly demonstrates that, you know, I mean, this interoperability can appear at many different levels here. So we can imagine that, you know, even on a technical side, like communicating with, between Starbucks and and GP Morgan New York, between GP Morgan New York and CT and between CT and Deutsche Bank London, it can be challenging even on the on the on the network side, on the technical communication side, but it can be challenging actually uh on a on a, on a semantic level and on a business level as well. So it's not necessarily easy. And again, this is like an oversimplified example. So we might as well say actually Deutsche Bank is not in London, but in Frankfurt. So if you just want to 
transfer money to uh, to Deutsche Bank Frankfurt. Then uh, then we got like one more bank somehow in the roadmap. So this is not just like one hop, but actually it's like two hops. So we have like a British bank somewhere here, and then we have the German bank at the end of the end of the line. So it can be even more complex. And basically, if we just just consider the uh, possible problems of interops uh, at each level, then we can imagine that basically having like technical interop challenges, uh, semantic or business interop challenges, actually multiply uh, with the number of hops uh, in this line. In this line, so that's correspondent banking. Uh, we can have like another other dimension from from interoperability between different payment systems, uh, including but not limited to, to correspondent banking. And this is from this uh, BIS report as well. So we can consider like different structures of interoperability. So the simplest one that I practically demonstrated on the last side is this one, that's this uh, single access point. We got here two jurisdictions and then practically uh, two two banks um, or two institutes. Let me let me put it that way. And we got one institute or one bank which which acts kind of a bridge uh, between these two jurisdictions. So in our use case, for instance, uh, uh, Deutsche Bank London have like practically an account at City New York. So this City New York acts as a bridge uh, practically in this uh, in this interoperability scenario. Uh, this is, of course, the simplest one, uh, but the problem is, I mean, it's itself such a single point uh, point of uh, point structure can have light, uh, like like uh, interoperability challenges. Uh, but we can imagine if we have like many banks, like hundred banks on this side and two hundred banks on on the other side, then it scales very bad uh, badly. So basically, it's just uh, getting very complicated, uh, very fast, and very inefficient, very fast. There are other structures as well. So we can imagine like the, the bilateral link. We got like two jurisdictions and two banks and then each having an account in another bank. So that's practically the, as, as far as I know, these are the nostro Ostro accounts. And then things, things getting better in a sense, then uh, it goes smoothly, the transfer, not just in one direction, but in, in both of the directions. Um, but the problem is uh, here as well that if you just want to scale, so if you just imagine 100 banks here and 100, bank, 100 banks on the other sides, or if you just imagine not just, I mean, even like like two jurisdictions, 100 and, uh, and 100 banks, that's going to be like, I, as far as I know, like 5,000 connections. So it's pretty many. Uh, but if you just imagine that there are not just two countries, not just two jurisdictions, but like, I don't know, 20, then things getting even more complicated. There's another structure as well, that's the hub and spoke model. Uh, in this situation, we got a hub somewhere uh, that acts practically as an agent, uh, which which just helps somehow <coughs> in cross-border payment. Uh, so basically it connects several different banks on several different jurisdictions or several different countries. Uh, of course, it's 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 much better in in sense of like connections or in sense of possible connections because it's not exponential; it's just just linear. But of course, it's getting it's getting complex. So basically, this hub should be set up. It can have like uh, all the inefficiencies uh, in terms of charging fee for the uh, for the for the service uh, which resides in higher cost, um, having problems in interoperability, um, having problems in operation, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course, one, I would say, ideal solution might be, uh, which still doesn't really exist, but perhaps uh, blockchain gives a promise of, of having such, uh, such platforms as well. That's a common platform where we have here something common uh, as a common platform, and we just we just somehow connect uh, many many banks on many countries and all the cross border payments somehow uh, via this via this common platform. Of course, that's the most complex, and it requires probably the most 
I would say research and development and, and investigation as well. But basically that's what that's what blockchain cross-border systems target. It's just because blockchain seems to be like like a natural way of of, of realizing such platforms. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I have just two lists. Um, so first, uh, I have the I have basically a map on the on the different um, CBDC uh, central bank digital uh, currency projects throughout the world uh, from from Hyperledger. So I'm not quite sure if I let me just take a look if I find this. Uh, I just tried to. I'm not quite sure if I find it, but but anyway, if I just click on that. Sorry, just uh, give me a second to find back. So if I just click on that, it's a very that's a very good uh, ebook uh, from from Hyperledger. Uh, it lists practically it's, it appeared like I don't know a couple of couple of months ago, and it lists pretty much the uh, the possible uh, central bank digital currency initiatives uh, that that have that have Hyperledger as as a technology. Uh, so that's that's like the Hyperledger marketing actually. Uh, and then uh, perhaps it's important to note. Uh, usually, I mean, these are CBDC projects. Um, they are they are not necessary cross border wholesale CBDC projects uh, in this book. Uh, there are there are wholesale CBDCs that uh, that don't want to uh, realize like uh, like 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 cross border uh, use cases, and there are re retail CBDC projects as well. Uh, but the point is, uh, we got like many technologies uh, or many platforms that appear in these CBDC projects. Uh, so, like uh, especially in wholesale, wholesale and cross-border wholesale use cases, we got basic platforms such as Hyperledger Bezu, Hyperledger Fabric, and uh, sometimes Iroha um, can be found as well. Uh, perhaps it's just just mentioning one thing. Uh, having having or speaking of like like wholesale CBDC projects, uh, blockchain is blockchain might be a viable uh, technology option. So if you speak of like like retail CBDC use case, then then blockchain user uh, usually is like you know difficult uh, because in a in a normal retail use case, you might as well have like a couple of millions of transactions transactions uh, each day. Uh, which which might be which might be just just much for a standard uh, blockchain platform, uh, but if we speak of like like cross border or wholesale CBDC projects, then then Hyperledger, Bezu, and Fabric are are viable platforms as well. So then 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 as far as I know, like Bezu has like four or five hundred transactions per per sec. Uh, Fabric can have like like thousands. Uh, but that's enough uh, for a wholesale or for a, for a, for a cross border cross border wholesale uh, wholesale project. And we got, of course, like Cacti, that's like an interoperability solution. Firefly, that's like an application building platform, and then I I Iroa, which is uh, which is like uh, which is like uh, which is like a blockchain platform itself as well. And then on the left side, I just I just mentioned a couple of like wholesale cross border CBDC projects. Um, there were many initiatives actually. These were like POCs and, and pilots. So as far as I know, not many went still not many went uh, many went live, but probably uh, it is planned that for instance, like Ambridge uh, goes live like a couple of years uh, in a couple of years. So then um, again, these these were like uh, POCs and pilots. But I mean, this CBDC uh, topic is 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 anyway something which is which is be, being developed very slowly, um, for for several reasons. So it's it's not the not the classical uh, crypto life cycle. So we got like Ambridge, uh, Ambridge uh, used practically at, at at the first Hyperledger Bezu. It further developed Bezu, uh, as far as I know at the moment. Uh, and then it's it's like from the BIS, from Hong Kong Monetary Authority, uh, from Central Bank of United Arab, Arab Emirates, uh, Central Bank of Thailand, and People Bank of China uh, experimented with with like Ambridge project. We got like Project Dunbar. Uh, project Dunbar is used the technologies of Africa. Uh, 
uh, it was it was a whole a cross border CBDC initiative from BIS, of course. I mean BIS involved in many of these projects uh, from from Australia, Malaysia, Singapore, and and perhaps uh, South Africa, as far as I remember. And then we got uh, Project Aber, that's on Hyperledger Fabric. It's uh, it's an initiative by 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 Saudi Arabia and and United Arab Emirates. Then we got like Jasper. Um, it's as far as I know that wasn't a cross border initiative, just the wholesale CBDC, and with like uh, Canada uh, was actually the major major player. Then we got like Jura Project Jura uh, that was that was on Corda, our free Corda. So it was an initiative by BIS, uh, by 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 Banque de France, uh, and Swiss National Bank as well. And then we got like Stella Project Stella. That's again. That's that's as far as I know, it's on fabric, uh, or it was an experimentation on fabric. It was uh, it was a it was a prototype by by the European Central Bank and and Japan as, uh, and and Bank of Japan Japan as well. And actually, we got. I mean, this is a non complete list of of like such wholesale cross border initiatives. Uh, these were the classical ones. Uh, we got some some non classical ones as, as well. So for instance, like GP Morgan Onyx platform is, is rather a general tokenization framework. It, it wasn't necessarily meant by, by realizing uh, cross-border use cases, use cases or only cross-border use cases. Uh, it, it can have like perhaps even stable coins as well, bank deposit tokens as well. But as far as I know, there's like ongoing brainstorming and discussion how that can be used like in uh, cross-border um, use cases as well. Then we got like Project Icebreaker. So again, uh, it's um, it's not a wholesale, but, uh, but a really interesting. Then we have like Project Maricek by uh, Singapore, France, and and Switzerland, and it it goes a little bit beyond cross border use cases. So the only use case is not just not just having payment cross border. But like, but like giving a uh, regulated this DeFi decentralized finance services cross border, and then we got many many ideas. So as far as I know, like the like the the the, uh, the European Central Bank with the with the digital euro, um, then they just they just initiated a couple of cross border projects as well. I mean, the digital euro itself is uh, is cross border, but that's not blockchain. But they they just initiated some uh, some 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 cross border project uh, prototypes as well. So this is just the general roadmap. Uh, I just picked practically three uh, three different projects. Uh, it's like uh, Embry, Jaber, and Ice Icebreaker. Just just having one and one slide of them on them. Uh, so, so perhaps it's uh, just I'm just having this one beautiful slide. If I manage this, just give me a second. Not this one, but I hope I didn't. Just give me a second. <clears throat> So I made a beautiful picture just to just to see basically uh, how things work, and I hope I still have it. Um, so so what we think of practically with these use cases is that uh, like we have many jurisdictions. In most of these prototypes, we had like two, three, or four different countries, different jurisdictions, and these uh, cross-border uh, use cases or DLT platforms try to connect uh, practically these countries. So in this example, I get just three countries. Uh, that's like country one, that's like country two, and that's like country three. In each country, we have a central bank that's like central bank A, central bank B, and cent central bank B, and central bank C, and central bank two and three. And here we got one, two, three as well. And here we got one, two, three as well. So most of these projects uh, try to somehow deliver one common DLT platform, one common uh, blockchain platform for, for realizing all of these uh, cross-border payments. 
And then there are many use cases. So usually there are like use casing transferring between one commercial bank domestically, uh, between uh, then transferring between two central banks internationally, and between transferring two commercial banks internationally. So these are the typical use cases. And, and again, so like in Project Labor, we just just two participants. In Enbridge, we have like 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 four participants, if I'm not mistaken. And then in Icebreaker, we have again uh, three participants. So that's like the major idea. And we got, of course, kind of a blockchain in the middle uh, on which we got the tokenization, which is kind of different fungible tokens, uh, usually version of or regulated versions of, of, of ERC20. And we got something as well, which, which might be you know, in exchange, for instance. So usually it, it looks that way that, you know, I mean, this country issues one one token on the blockchain, which is like one central bank digital currency. And the second one issues one issues another one. And the third one issues a third one. And this should be uh, interoper interoperable as well from a business perspective. So they are interoperable on the technical side because we got a common blockchain. Uh, they are interoperability from the semantic side as well because they are all, all the same fungible tokens, like version of ERC20, but they should be interoperable in the business, on the business side as well. So like, like question is how we can exchange one, one central bank digital currency to another one, one token to another one. So that's the usual uh, structure. And again, we got like Enbridge. Enbridge is one project. It's a, it's a wholesale cross-border CBDC. Uh, the funding banks uh, was People Bank of China, uh, Monetary Authority of Hong Kong, Central Bank of Thailand, and, and Central Bank of United Arab Emirates, uh, and of course BIS. And then these these were the active members. There were like twenty five observing members as well. Uh, the first version was, or the second version was Hyperledger Bezu. At the moment, they have like something which is called an Enbridge Ledger. <clears throat> as far as I know, it's either either Bezu or Forum was further developed, uh, but the second phase was 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 clearly on Hyperledger Bezu. Uh, it has payment versus payment, uh, uh, different use cases. It has foreign exchange and liquidity saving mechanism as well. It has advanced privacy concepts and it has uh, like ISO components as well. So I'm happy to see somehow the idea how how basically such a platform might help in, uh, in cross-border payment. So in the classical world, we got like one payer, we have like, like the payers bank, and we can have like many correspondent banks in the middle. And at the end, we have like the pays bank and we have the pays. So that's the, the classical flow of, of an international, of a cross-border payment. With Enbridge, uh, we just get the two banks. So we have the payers bank and we have the pays bank. And the idea is everything is, uh, everything which, which different from these two banks uh, responsibility is realized by the, by the Enbridge itself. So like, for instance, classical uh, KYC, AML, and customer relations are maintained by these banks. So that's that's somehow the idea uh, for Enbridge and for, for other initiatives as well. So the next project is, is Project Aber. That's like a OSCE cross-border CBDC project. Uh, we got like funding banks, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates. It's interesting because it's on Hyperledger fabric. So again, it has like strong correlation with uh, with like Hyperledger, uh, with the Hyperledger stack. Uh, it has many use cases. It's like cross-border settlement between central banks, again, domestic settlement between commercial banks, cross-border settlement between commercial banks. Um, it has a dual currency systems. And then there's no like, um, like a foreign exchange, uh, which is dynamic. They have they have just a static exchange rate. Uh, then future there are some delivery versus payment uh, investigations and it is integrated with uh, with RTGS uh, as well. Uh, perhaps it's just just having one one 
challenges of uh, or mentioning one challenge um realizing realizing uh, basically cross border with blockchain technology that that's basically privacy so classical dlt system a classical blockchain system is designed in a way that that everybody sees everything practically but this is certainly not very optimal <laughs> for uh, for such a cross border use case so usually the the privacy uh, the privacy uh, requirements are, are can be challenging in such use cases usually we got the we got the requirement that if two commercial banks transact then only these two banks should see the transaction for instance if two uh, international commercial bank uh, transact then then only the commercial banks and perhaps the central banks should see the transaction if a central bank issues new cbdc a uh, central bank digital currency to a commercial bank then then only this commercial bank should basically see that uh, that transaction uh nobody should see basically the accounts so how how much money um a person have um, on an account that's like an information that it shouldn't be visible even for central banks so again um if you just consider of, of course i mean i mean blockchains having like like different uh, privacy solutions as well but if you just consider that you know, blockchain basically means that everybody sees everything, uh, then then having these use cases from a privacy perspective, um, yeah, it's it's just sometimes getting pretty complicated. So in like Project Tabor, uh, there were many private data collections on on Hyperledger Fabric that were that were used. So there were like uh, like like two uh, two participants private data collections between commercial banks including central banks as well <clears throat> there were like uh, privacy data private data collections having the commer having one commercial bank and the central bank and there was like one one big channel uh basically so sorry that these were not private data collections these were channels um, and there that was one big channel uh, that included uh that somehow prevented practically double spending between between channels. Um, so it was pretty tricky. One more project is uh, Project Icebreaker. Uh, that's uh, that's an initiative from Norway, Sweden, and and Israel, and it's basically uh, that's a, that's a retail use case. So it's it's not a wholesale cross border, but a retail cross border um, pilot or 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 uh, or proof of concept. Uh, what's interesting is that the idea is uh, that basically each country has its own payment system, uh, which which in our use case basically uh, like like Sweden Sweden had like uh, Arfri Korda uh, Hyperledger Bezu was used by Norway and Quorum as a platform was used by by Israel, and they were connected uh, with the. Uh, with the hub and spoke model, uh, with atomic cross chain payments and HTLC hash time lock contracts. So basically, this hub in the middle uh, guaranteed basically the atomic settlement uh, between uh, between these systems, uh, which is which is a very innovative model. Uh, this atomic uh, settlement and and hub in the middle that integrated uh, like like a, like foreign exchange as well. So basically, there were like uh, providers in the model uh, that traded uh, these currencies, uh, and then basically during the the atomic cross chain swap during the hard HTLCs, um, it was possible uh, not just to to have like one atomic transaction, but to change one currency to another one, um, even with like having a bridge uh, currency in the middle as well. So that's Project Icebreaker. Uh, just just one table for the end. Uh, it's like a little bit like comparison of different cross border CBDC projects. Of course, it's a little bit like marketing oriented. Uh, but like if you just compare them and then just uh, take a look on the different inefficiencies like transaction transparency, operation operating hours interoperability transaction cost infrastructure challenges and payment models then we can usually say that yeah so 
So blockchain has the promise uh, and DLT has the promise of, 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 of doing something better for sure. Uh, so like a trans transaction transparency is, is better practically overall uh, than, for instance, from in, uh, than in correspondent banking. Of course, this is a little bit like tricky because, uh, you know, I mean, of course, it's possible to do a very good transparency with blockchain, but like privacy requirements are usually challenging. So, I mean, if we say that privacy, then perhaps the situation is not so good. Uh, operating hours, well, I mean, I mean, all of these systems or almost all of these systems are are practically seven twenty four. Uh, so they don't they don't suffer basically like the problems of limited operating hours. Supposing that you know, I mean, I mean, there's there's like people who can operate a blockchain in in uh, uh, in this in this time period. Uh, interoperability is is supposed to be higher overall. Transaction cost is supposed to be uh, supposed to be lower. Uh, well, in, for infrastructure challenges, um, yeah, I mean, for the first round, I mean, it's blockchain. So, so blockchain again, it's not necessarily the easiest to to operate and to deliver as an infrastructure, but it's one infrastructure. So it's one universe, uni uh, universe and infrastructure. There's no like such situation that each node having like something totally different. So usually infrastructure challenges uh, are considered to be uh, moderate. And then for payment model, so again, these are the uh, hub and spoke common platform or single or dual links. So most of these platforms try to do something which is a common platform, which is one common platform. That's that's what blockchain actually meant to do, basically. There are some exceptions like hub and spoke models and so on. So that's my last slide. And so as a conclusion and further challenges, uh, so I would conclude in a way that, so these DLT-based cross-border payments uh, seem, seem to solve many inefficiencies uh, of classical payment systems. Again, these projects are still pretty much in, you know, I mean, prototyping and proof of concepts. Uh, there's just one one interesting idea which is which is still not really uh, brainstormed very much. Uh, there might even the use case that like that like actually not cross border CBDC but something which is like tokenized deposit is used in cross border use cases. Uh, with tokenized deposit is just more tricky <laughs> because with uh, tokenized deposits, I mean it's simple to issue a token on a on a blockchain uh, in the name of a bank, but the problem is to uh, to have the exact liability of the bank uh, for this token, that's like more tricky. Uh, and it's, I would say, it's perhaps it's just tricky to solve it in a domestic use cases as well. Uh, it's probably more tricky to solve it in an international use case. But I'm sure there will be initiatives uh, for this one as well. Uh, uh, blockchain can provide near real-time cross-border payment. Uh, so I mean, transaction should actually be executed in a couple of seconds uh, independently of of the of the of the underlying blockchain platform uh, it is estimated that the that the reduction reduction in transaction cost might be like 50 80% of course uh, these systems are are 724 uh, systems uh, then it can realize kind of a direct interbank payment without without intermediaries i mean i mean blockchain itself is an intermediary that's that's for sure but otherwise no further intermediaries um, are to be found. And then heavily investigated, it's, it's like, you know, automatic foreign exchange by smart contracts, sometimes even uh, like, like regulated DeFi on top uh, such a platforms. But nevertheless, there are still challenges. So I would say uh, that I'm more like a technical uh, expert. So I focus always on the technical challenges. So I would see, say these use cases are not not typical DLT use cases, and it's again it's it's because there are like many different privacy requirements. Uh, who should see what information? And of course, like enterprise blockchain solutions provide like solutions for that. So that, then in fabric like we get channels, we get private data collections. But if there are like too many such requirements, then the then the whole system is is getting to be like. Uh, I mean, I mean, more, I mean, too complex and and somehow, uh, perhaps uh, somehow not the best and and of course not, 
not like a native uh, blockchain idea. Uh, perhaps it's 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 worth mentioning that some of the challenges were actually not were out of the scope of these pilots. Uh, so, for instance, governance was usually out of the scope. Uh, then usually like like different regulatory compliance uh, based on multiplied jurisdictions, the they were partly out of the scope, so they might cause problems. Uh, nevertheless, like different onboarding key, KYC and email processes. I mean, in most scenarios, uh, these are actually done by by the banks itself, by commercial banks, but nevertheless, they they can cause problems. I mean, again, these are like the technical challenges. So privacy is an issue. Scalability is not so much an issue in these use cases. I would say that's not retail. And then again, things are getting more complicated is if these use cases are getting complicated with like uh, having foreign exchange uh, with uh, with uh, with automated market making, uh, for instance, or having uh, like kind of regulated uh, <clears throat> DEXs or kind of regulated DeFi protocols on top of these use cases or like uh, payment versus payment, payment versus delivery use cases, because then, you know, I mean, I mean, privacy uh, requirements considering these use cases might actually explode exponentially. Uh, so that's not very practical. So that was my presentation. Uh, it was not taking so fast or I, I just couldn't manage so fast as I as I wanted it, so I, I I apologize for that. But I would say uh, we still got like like five minutes for for questions and answers. Thanks, uh, Daniel. And I would say that now is the time to ask questions if you if you want to. Please uh, do raise your hand or start uh, asking questions. Uh, I'm just checking the chat as well. So if you, uh, if you just just chat me, then, then feel feel free to ask ask uh, ask questions in the chat as well, or just unmute yourself and 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 go ahead. I think uh, most people are still absorbing a lot of the uh, lot of the presentation that has taken place. Um, it's a it's a vast topic, as you know. So I'm going to give a, a minute more for others. Otherwise, I will jump into the question. Mark, of course, Mark Liberati, my good friend, is asking. Uh, is he asking questions, or he's just said yes? Yeah, um, I don't know if you can hear me. I was just, uh, no, I was just wanted to really thank you for the excellent overview, um, but also just really um, thinking around, you know, all of these projects are still between between various ecosystems. Um, what has been the thinking in creating sort of a, at an international level, uh, a, a, a mechanism so that uh, there could be interoperability going through an, an international um, layer, if you will, um, to support interoperability in a more global, coordinated manner. Over. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a that's a very good question. Uh, so that that would be logical. Uh, that would be logical. Uh, and then I think that's the reason why why, for instance, BIS is is involved in many of these projects. Uh, because uh, because that's you know that's that's pretty international, has connections with with many central banks. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know if there's any such initiative at the moment. Uh, so it's like, you know, it should be controlled by by IMF, for instance, or, or I don't know which would be like, you know, the best best controlling body uh, body for for such an initiative. Uh, that that would be the most logical. It's just you know having having like one one big platform which is used like you know if if it is used like by the by the forty percent of of the world. Or fifty percent, that would be a big, a big advantage. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, the word is sometimes not logical. I would say so. So I don't know about such such an initiative. But I, but I totally agree that that would be that would be the best way. Yeah. 
Uh, to add to that, uh, you know that Swift is the platform, at least on this side of the world. There are other platforms being born um, on other in other jurisdictions or countries uh, that want to not be under uh, you know dependent on Swift, which can be controlled by the U.S. or other forces. Uh, so for a truly uncensorable cross-border payments, uh, the Chinese are coming up with some kind of payment service. The Indians have the UPI, which is uh, transferring to other countries, especially in the Gulf. Uh, so there is a certain amount of standardization there. Then uh, SWIFT itself uh, had to reform its message format, mostly, I believe, under two conditions. One is the challenges of blockchain itself. And as money often says, uh, you know, the CDM is a blockchain in miniature because it links the different, uh, the different transaction or the uh, chaining there is a chaining aspect, which is based on cryptography, and there is also a um, another piece, which is encryption. Now, this is also started uh, influencing 10.0.1022, the uh, global uh, sort of meta standard that Swift operates under. So blockchain has influenced these uh, platforms and uh, swift is uh, having you know had problems because of uh, because of because of things getting uh, because of fraud because of cyber attacks because of ways in which money could be transferred uh, you know they could the fraudsters could jump on top of SWIFT and cause spurious money transfers. Uh, that, I think, has been addressed in 10.0.22. But both the chaining aspect, the signature aspect, and the um, encryption aspect were optional. I don't know whether they tighten down on that. But I'm sure the Chinese and the Indian model uh, will also work. So there are going to be um, different sort of standards and actual infrastructure that cross, cross border and that uh, are very active, uh, actively looked at. So in a sense, they are not exactly worldwide but they encompass more than one country. So maybe that's the right way to do this. And then you can have crossing between these big systems. Then you get to a worldwide system. So I think uh, the time has run out, unless anybody else has anything particular to ask, uh, we should uh, say that this has been a very good, very good presentation. Thanks to Daniel, and thanks to all all of you who attended. So yeah, thanks thanks for the opportunity and, and thanks for the audience. Yes. Thank you and uh, goodbye for now. One month from now, we'll have another presentation. Thank you.